I think with sort of writing for younger uh, children, I had to think about the books that I would have liked to have read to my daughter when she was younger. And it was, it was actually, Toad Attack was inspired by a Simpsons episode where Springfield is taken over by lizards. <laughs> um, so I just imagine what if you walked out of your house and a toad landed on your head and then kind of created the story from, from there. But because also it's for um, Barrington Stoke, which are dyslexia friendly um, publisher. I had I thought a lot about the language that I used, but also knew that it was going to be edited by um, editors who look for words that aren't going to make uh, young people with uh, dyslexia stumble. So you knew it's going to be much more of a collaborative process than it would normally be when you're writing for an older age group. But it was good fun, and also I just wondered. The toad is actually called Twerky, and I just wondered how many teachers are suddenly going to be a little bit taken aback by the fact that also the town is up a dab, so suddenly all these children are going to be dabbing, and I just hope that actually there's not going to be any in-class twerking. <laughs> the book was an accident. I didn't actually set out to write the book. Um, I tried writing for children, and I'd had an agent, and I tried writing books for uh, middle grade. Um, I tried about four different books, you know, four le lots of 75,000 words, and all of them agents said, you know, aren't good enough to be published, which they weren't. But I just thought, I can't do this. So my plan was to write um, adult crime, and I had a whole series of books set out, um, set in 1940s Trinidad, with a protagonist who happened to be a woman in her 40s. Um, and I'd done so much research on this, and I went to a week-long crime writing course and as part of the course they gave everybody a prompt, an individual prompt and they said that um, when you write crime you have to hide clues so you hide this prompt as a clue and my prompt was he woke up dreaming of yellow so you just think apocalypse in Simpsons you know no idea and then I just remembered there'd been a teacher strike two weeks before and being a really good, responsible parent, I'd taken my then year seven uh, daughter to um, Hyde Park Winter Wonderland. And we'd spent the whole day walking around complaining about how expensive everything was. It was great, really good, you know, mother bonding, complaining about how everything is expensive. Um, and then we managed to get enough money together for a hot dog. And so suddenly I thought, mustard. And I just imagined a 16 year old boy watching this girl who's way above his league buying him a hot dog and putting mustard on it. He hates mustard, but he likes that girl more, so he will eat that hot dog. So Marlon came to me then and, and I wrote that scene and because it's a crime book, they said some a crime's got to happen. So I think, okay, girl dies at the end. And I never thought I would write that book, but when I wrote that chapter, I really wanted to know why. I really wanted to know about Marlon. Why was he with her? Why did she die? Who was she? And I free wrote the next chapter, so suddenly there was an older brother who um, had been a bad boy but was in supported housing. I had no idea why. And so it just literally came out of this one exercise, this book that I never knew I had in me and ended up writing. I think I just wanted to write lovely young men. I wanted to write lovely young men of colour. Um, with uh, Orange Boy, I wanted to really wanted to explore what makes lovely people do not very nice things. And I think the heart of that initially was thinking about growing up in Sussex in the 70s, sort of 70s and 80s, and being one of the few young people of colour at my school and in my my street and in the town. And it was a time, I think, when people would still be very explicit in their racism. So people would shout things out of your cars and. But if somebody said something to me, it wasn't such an issue because I had a sense of my own identity. But a sense of somebody says something to my younger brothers. I twisted arms, I shouted. Um, I remember once um, when my youngest brother was about seven, some of his friends bringing him back to our house um, because uh, crying because a neighbour, a grown man, had called him a name. So my mum, um, very much a Trinidadian lady, had wafted out of the house in her caftan, smelling of Chanel number no. five, knocked on the door to say, did you call my son whatever? The grown man said yes. My mum went, <laughs> and there was blood. Um, but that does that sense of when 
people you care for, uh, you feel are under attack, um, and you protect it, changes you into a different person. So I was interested in exploring that with Marlon, but also that sense of how young men who pick up knives are kind of dehumanised in a way, they become a statistic or a promising footballer or a promising rapper and there's nothing I was really interested in that dynamic. With Bailey I really wanted to write a middle class mixed race family, um, right on Guardian reading, <laughs> a campaigning against apartheid which is how his parents met even though that's not in the book, I knew it. Um, but I was really interested in writing that kind of dynamic and about the young men that I know who are caring, sensitive, self-aware and I wanted to put them both in books. There are two characters in Indigo Donut, Soraya whose dad is really really strict and also like me she's an older sister and I think us older sisters we need our advocates so much and Austin who's Nigerian Muslim because there are obviously not enough Nigerian Muslims in YA these days and he's got a bit of a mouth on him as in a sort of East sort of London guy and in Indigo Donut there are already a couple Soraya and Austin and I kind of was quite interested to know one why Soraya's dad was so strict and to um, how Soraya got together with Austin. But also, I mean, I think a lot of things are inspired by what goes on locally. So um, I was walking past, there's a sort of quite a big church near to, to where I live, and quite often there are funerals there for young people who have died of sort of knife crime or other sort of violence. And I was walking past and I saw it's obviously really, it was a predominantly black working class. Um, people going to a funeral there and I was really I suppose slightly I wanted to explore that dynamic what's it like if it's a relative of yours a young man who's the one whose funeral it is so that kind of fueled that what's it like being at the other end of that that crime um, so I was really in the other thing is it's very very odd but I've got a slight obsession with scaffolding <laughs> and I think it's because in Hackney wherever you go there's so much development um, everywhere and it's what is it like if you climb that scaffolding and you climb to the top and you sit out looking at the rest of the world so I think kind of like all my books it's a weird conglomeration of different ideas that eventually gel into some type of narrative but it was yeah Soraya why is her dad so strict and what happens if that's someone you know that is being buried yes I think it's because I'm not from London and but I've been here I suppose now half my life so you're kind of both a resident and a tourist still and I just think I think part of it is a vexation that um, a lot of the exports around London, for instance, Richard Curtis films, there's nobody like me unless you're strolling randomly past a stall in Notting Hill market. So I wanted to put back the fantastic variety of young people that, for instance, if my, my daughter might have round, the young people I see in schools every day, the young people who are never exported in the films and um, TV series about England overseas. So, and also London has got that really nerdy, it pulls the real nerdy side of me around the whole, I suppose, psychogeography of it, the layers of history that you see every day, the different stories everywhere, you know, and there's just so much to, do, I suppose, to discover. And also just, I think, almost <laughs> sometimes of locations. It's like Horniman's Museum is like, wow, you know, a room's full of stuffed animals. Why not? So it's <laughs> just in the Covent Garden, like all of that. London is such an amazing place to set stories. Okay, Diver's Daughter is quite interesting. So I was approached by Tony Bradman, who had seen uh, the black, uh, UK Black History series by David Olusuga. He felt there was so much history in our curriculum and that one of the ways, I suppose, of um, raising the profile of UK Black and Asian history was through, in a sense, through fiction and getting it into, into schools. And he, he said to me, do I want to write uh, Romans or do I want to write Tudors? Um, three weeks before, I'd bought a copy of Miranda Kaufman's Black Tudors and it was like 1799 hardback. I thought, yeah, I'm doing shooters. Um, and it had the story of um, uh, Jack Francis, who had come uh, as an uh, African diver um, who uh, had been assembled as part of a team by a sort of Venetian merchant to help raise the Mary Rose and other warships in the sort of mid 16th century in Southampton. 
And I was probably in my 30s before I knew that there'd really been black people in the UK before the 1940s or 1930s. And I'm thinking, 16th century? And I grew up around Sussex, so that's sort of, I remember that's sort of when the Mary Rose was raised in like the 80s. And uh, I wished I'd had that connection, knowing that people like me were in the south of England, were involved in that part of history at that time. So I felt that was a story that had to be told. Also, Jack Francis was one of the, I think, is the first recorded man of African descent to give evidence in the uh, English law court. So that all is sort of expunged from, from history, in a sense. But the problem is, if you're writing for children, I didn't want to write a biography of a man. I wanted to write something from a child's point of view. So, sort of fictionalised a young woman um, of mixed heritage. Her mum had come... Uh, been taken by the Portuguese from the Isle of Mozambique, so had come to the enslavement to Portugal and Italy and ended up in Southwark, <laughs> of all places. Um, but, they, but she can dive as well, because she grew up on an island that, where you learn to dive. So she hears that, you know, that there is treasure that might be in the ship, and they just had to find Jack Francis to find out where it is. So it's kind of a fictionalised story, but bringing in real, real history. I think I write about them because some of the things are, you know, impacted on my life. So my, I've never, I never lived with my biological father, though I, I certainly knew him. But he died when he was younger than I, now, than I am now. He was a man who was, um, he, you know, he did a degree in philosophy. He was a big reader. He was a musician, but he had a breakdown in his forties. Spent a month in prison for forging a check, but that meant he couldn't work. So he became homeless and, and an alcoholic and, and died in a, in a fire. And it took me quite a long time to process, the, the, I suppose I still am, the grief of it, but also his experience. But also I know that if I talk in a hall of young people, there's going to be lots of young people who are hiding a bit of themselves away, because there are some things like, uh, I suppose, like grief and loss that are very hard to talk to, to um, other people, because you're dealing with other people's reactions, so you just don't talk about it. And there's a sense, I suppose, when you write about these things, that you want to know, you want other people, you suppose young people to know that actually some of us have got your back, we understand, and if you can't talk to people, they're your friends in books. So for me it's quite important because of my own experiences and, and history. But also I want to write books that have got hope in them. And what's been really interesting was with Indigo Donut, I did um, an event at the school's event at the Hay Festival last year, and um, an organisation from Wales bought some care experience young people. And at the end of the signing, there was a big long queue, because I, I, I was privately fostered for four years, so it's kind of not the same as being in care, but I wasn't living with my mum for the first four years. So we talked, you know, that, that sense about how you try and build, rebuild relationships within your family, about trying to find out who you are. So they invited me to come and speak at their Being Proud of Who You Are Day this year. So for me, I think actually those stories resonate. Um, and I think also just wider in terms of being a young person and a teenager about you're still trying to work out who you are. There's so many people trying to shape who you are, whether it's school or media or social media. So there, I think there are wider things that young people take from it as well. <laughs> it is really weird because I've just come back from doing some school visits in Hong Kong and what was really interesting was actually the young people in Hong Kong were just like the same as young people in London really. And the weird, <laughs> what's really interesting is about how about certain global influences is, and there's one slide that I put up that you do not expect from me which is a picture from a still from a quite iconic Korean drama which my daughter <laughs> got me into. So actually for me I always say because I actually also what I want is uh, young people to feel that you can tell your story, you can write, that you know, if you're right, it doesn't matter about your spelling. That's what spell check's there for. You know, when we talk or when we write, we don't write in sentences. We don't care about the, the grammatical makeup and what the names of different parts are. That's something else. So for me, just to, I talk about why, how my daughter got me into Korean drama very, very reluctantly. And then when I got into it, it's like, oh my gosh, this is so good because it's sponsored. So therefore, they have to write episodes that have got really good characterisation, really good arcs within each episode, but overarching arcs across the series. They've got to have, even no matter how preposterous the concept is, they've got to have characters that you engage with and really are rooting for. So I can't often say that, you know, we should say we want to write like Dickens or Dostoevsky, but actually I want to write like Korean drama. And I kind of get it, that sort of popular culture. Um, but also quite a lot of 
Another thing is in my books, I always write young people of mixed heritage because virtually everybody, my, my, my brother's um, dad's Italian, um, my daughter's dad's white, um, you know, my, my dad was sort of uh, Indian heritage and my mum African heritage. So I've never lived in a family where we're all the same colour. I've never lived in a family with my mum and my dad. So I, in my books, I write a lot, all my, a lot of different family structures. So a lot of young people engage with that. And also a lot of young mixed heritage people always at the end. Because I talk about how people try and work out, you know, are you Korean? Are you? you know, for my daughter, you know, a whole range of. So every time a young person of mixed heritage will come up and say, I know. <laughs> I get it. And it's actually those little details of seeing yourself reflected where you think the author so gets it, I think it's so important for young people. They see themselves and think, yeah. I think actually, I think thinking of myself is I didn't write a, a person of colour in a, to a story until I was 32. Um, I've been writing since I was little. Um, I used to send off poems, I used to send off short stories. Um, I once sent a short story to some like true romances and it got published as a, as a mixed race sort of protagonist as a, as, a, as a sort of boy, only because I'd actually read a, book, a short story before in a magazine that had a mixed race. And I just thought, I thought nobody does that ever because they won't publish it. So until I was 32, and I just had my daughter, she's like two weeks old, and I was sitting there in December in Hackney with a sort of wind and a drizzle hitting the window, thinking, what do I do with this thing? Um, and I turned on the telly, and it was the um, BBC adaptation of Pick Art Boy, and I turned on this programme, and it was like a black family, a UK black family, recognise those actors, like, he's from Casualty, and like, That's, isn't that Mona from like, EastEnders? And it was about... Uh, ethics, it was about families, about friendship, it was about loyalty and it was just utterly amazing for me to see and then I read it was from a book by Mallory Blackman I said like, oh my gosh and it was like you know a door is open and you see a little chink of light and you sort of walk through thinking now I found my voice because I can write about the people I know and it kind of gave me that permission to do that because I've not seen it before in a curriculum in any books that I read in most programs that I saw so you get that like US you get, get the Cosby you get Fresh Prince of Bel-Air or something. but it's something that was a UK black family going about their business which even now feels a bit weird, actually I've never seen it so that gave me so that permission so for me to be able to go into schools part of that is to say to all those young people from all those different backgrounds that their voice matters that they can tell their stories they'd be fantastic stories and if you don't see them write them yourselves because that's what we did but just don't wait till you're 32. I'm really quite excited um the performance poet Dee Natter has got a book coming out with um, Hodder called Black Flamingo, which is about sexuality and about uh, race and about uh, drag. And it's also a, um, a first story, and I've been lucky enough to read you know, an early draft of that. So I'm really, and also set in Brighton and London, my places. <laughs> so, and it's also just a really, it's an English take on something which we rarely ever get. We get so many books that come over with a US African-American or Indian or, or sort of perspective, but we get so few UK books about it. And I think the amount of young people that book will resonate with, I think is so exciting. I think uh, Alexandra Shepard doing like, you know, a book about the gods set in Holloway. <laughs> you know? I just think utter respect that, because all those classic myths have always been so white, that you kind of look at them, but you know you can't be part of them. So to actually put ourselves in those stories are really exciting. Another one which is a little bit self-serving, but it's the, um, the Mallory Towers collection that I've been part of for, for Hachette. And to, you know, for me to put a, a black young woman and for uh, uh, Narinda Dami to put a, a sort of South Asian young woman into Mallory Towers and to bring that, those stories and make them relevant to a whole new audience, I think is actually a fantastic thing as well. Um, I liked um, uh, Mohammed Khan's new book, um, Kick the Moon about what if you're a little sort of Asian Muslim boy and you want to be a, you know, you can't be Superman because you're brown, so you will write your own comic books, I think. It's also it's about masculinity and deals with some quite tough subjects as well. So I think utter respect for him for, for doing that. So there's probably somebody I've missed out who's going to hate me. But, but I think there's some really interesting, you know, and if you think also about the um, anthology that um, Stripes did, A Change Is Going to Come and how the new writers who were commissioned, so like um, Yasmin Rahman's book is going to come out, which I think is really exciting.
I also have a copy, there's some really fantastic anthologies, so I've got a copy of, um, uh, is it not about the burqa, the one that, yeah, which I'm just waiting to delve into because I think Mariam is fantastic, um, and a copy of Safe, which is about um, young black, well, black British men and um, the space they occupy, and even though they're not young adult books, I think teenagers can read those books and resonate because they will be reflecting quite personal experiences. So I think that sense of those anthologies that are coming out are incredibly exciting too. I'm actually really proud to be part of this um, booklet which lists 104 writers and illustrators of colour based in the UK. So it's great that we get the US writers but actually there's no excuse not to promote, to explore, to look at the works of UK based writers and illustrators. So it's part of a, a, a collaboration between Speaking Volumes and Book Trust. It's free or go on a website so have a look at this. Well firstly just write, literally just write. Um, you don't have to write at you don't have to write every day, you don't have to write whole pieces of work, but just write, get your words down there. Um, once you start to feel confident about your writing, there's various different paths that you can take. Um, so you can look up in your particular area the um, writing development organisation. So in uh, London it's uh, Spread the Word, um, in sort of South it's New Writing South, it's Writing West Midlands, each area has got one. Look on their website about uh, for um, critique, for classes, for courses, for free stuff, lots of free stuff. Um, Another suggestion which really helped me was um, I joined a critique group and I would not have got published without them because um, certainly in Orange Boy there was an actual terrible subplot about a dodgy internet guy in a Cook Islands um, and for like a couple of them like, my writing group was saying like get rid of the dodgy internet guy. It's like no, no he's part of the plot. Luckily before I gave it to my agent I got rid of the dodgy internet guy which actually opened up the story to explore more. So a really good critique group can help you. Look at competitions as well, and there's so many of them now. So if you're younger, you know, there's the um, 500 words one in the BBC, and then there's the next step up, which is the uh, for 13 to 18 year olds, I think, short story competition in the BBC. There's the Young Writing Muslim Awards, Young, <laughs> Young Muslim Writers Awards, which covers lots of different genres. Um, Write, you know, write whatever, write fan fiction, write spoken word poetry and perform it on video. There are so many different platforms that you can write for. Try lots of different things so you can find, you know, you can find your thing, but just try them. And also I think just read, you know, read and read. It doesn't matter if it's manga, graphic novels, fan fiction, poetry, just read so you can really understand how far words can take you.